this evening. Uh, sorry for the late start. Uh, my name is Jared White, and I'm a program coordinator with the Come to the Table program with RAFI USA. Um, thank you for joining us for this evening's community conversation on the virtual racial wealth gap simulation. Um, in this simulation, we will learn how federal policies created structural inequities, property ownership, um, and education being just two of the many areas affected and how these policies increase hunger and poverty in communities of color. The simulation will guide us to an understanding of why racial equity is so important to ending hunger and poverty in the United States. Our hope is that we, in becoming more aware of structural inequity, can support policies that undo and reduce disparities. This conversation is hosted by Bread for the World and the, Race and the Rural Advancement Foundation International USA, or RAFI USA for short, and RAFI USA's Come to the Table program. And this event is part of Come to the Table's larger series called Spirit, Power, and Connection Community Conversation. The series is rooted in the belief that we must build strength together in order to have the power to build a more just food system. We believe that relationships are at the core of, of this work and that the connections between us are rooted in our common human spirit. Our hope for this community conversation series is that it will create opportunities for us to meet, learn from and deepen our connections with each other as we work towards justice. We are hosting this series as a way to build connections between people, sectors, and ideas. We are excited to host panelists um, and co-facilitators who have thought deeply on issues of justice in our food system and who are grounded in the work and can open a space to welcome the wisdom of everyone in the room. Uh, Co-facilitating this simulation uh, is Rosa Sabetra, um, and we will get to that in just a moment. Uh, but moving on to today's road roadmap, uh, we wanted to talk uh, a little bit before we start the simulation um, and go through how we will be spending our time together. Uh, first, we'll briefly talk um, about RAFI and the Community Conversation Series, which we've already done a little bit about. Um, after that, we will have an opening activity. Then we will review the scope of hunger and poverty in America, but everyone is on the same page. The largest chunk of our time will be spent doing the simulation, and then we will wrap up by having a larger group discussion. Before we go on, does anyone have any questions for how we will be spending our time together today? Great. Uh, so we can move on. Uh, of course, I've already briefly introduced uh, both RAFI and the Community Conversation Series. Uh, at RAFI USA, uh, we challenge the root causes of unjust food systems, supporting and advocating for economically, racially, and ecologically just farming communities. We envision a thriving, sustainable, and equitable food system, one where farmers and farm workers have dignity and agency and where they are supported by just agricultural policy, where corporations and institutions are accountable to their community. And of course, the Come to the Table program, uh, the Come to the Table program uh, presents this series, of course, the Community Conversation Series. Um, and I will pass it on to Rosa uh, to talk through uh, what Bread for the World does and a little bit about the racial wealth gap learning simulation. 
Hi, so uh, I am Rosa Saavedra and I'm the uh, North Carolina, South Carolina state organizer for Bread for the World. And if you're unfamiliar with Bread for the World, we are a collective, uh, or a collective Christian voice uh, in a nonprofit form. <laughs> um, and um, we really are a policy advocacy organization and an anti-hunger organization. But what we have to do, which is very similar to what Rafi does, is we have to address the root causes, right, of hunger. And so once we look at those root causes and racial uh, inequity uh, is one of those. Uh, so this is a great tool. I don't know if any of you have um, been able to participate in it, in it before, but it was developed as part of a collaboration between Bread for the World um, and an organization called Network. Uh, it was piloted in 2017, uh, and it's a originally it's an in-person um, activity, and we have of course had to modify it. And this one in particular uh, um, is is modified even more because it's to fit into um, Rafi's uh, community conversation. So it's been it's a real pleasure to be here with Rafi and with you all. Um, I want you to just keep that in mind because later on when we talk about what to do with this, um, I want you to think about what you could do with it. So um, to the next one. So we're going to um, run this poll. It should pop up in front of you. Uh, and there's basically two questions. Uh, before we get started, we, you don't have to have like super detailed information. Uh, could somebody pop the poll up or do you want me to do that? There it is. Okay, so uh, as you can see, there's two questions. It's, are you familiar with the racial wealth or income gap? It's just yes or no. I mean, it doesn't be, you know, you know how are you familiar with it or, you know, what exactly are you familiar with? And the other one is just, do you have an idea, whatever your idea is about what racial equity means and why it's important? Uh, so we'll wait a few minutes to see how people um, answer that because uh, I, I know I've had a lot of people that are familiar with the income gap as the notorious uh, difference between the genders, you know, male and female being so different. Um, so that is an income gap. And there's other, you know, income gaps as well. Okay, so we've got about half of the people. There are no uh, poll questions on my screen. Who is this speaking, Francine? Yes. Um, did you just come in just no. now? No, at the top it does say opening poll, but you can't see the questions. Are there other people that are having that problem? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I... A lot of people okay. in chat are saying yes. Okay. So, if you're okay, if you could just write in chat, you know, answer or just put one yes or no and two yes or no, and then we'll just look at it. But right now, it looks like uh, at least 13 of the respondents are saying yes. There, there aren't any no's. So, basically, what we'll look for in the chat is are there any no's? Um, Repeat the question. So the question, the first question is, are you familiar with the racial wealth or income gap? That's number one. And number two is, do you have an idea of what racial equity means and why it is important? And Karina, if you could kind of just tally up the yeses and nos, and I will go ahead and end because I think everybody who can see this has seen it. So can, can I end this polling right now? Yes, okay. All right. So we have a lot of people. You can see a lot of people, yes and no. Are there any no's in the chat? No, looks like 10 additional people said yes. Okay, great. So everybody's got some idea. And that's usually how it is. I'm really glad for that because that will help. Okay. Here's the result of that poll. Okay. What's that? Okay. 
So if if we can ask folks to um, mute when they're not speaking, that would be great. Um, so Jared, I am going to pass it to you to take it uh, to our next section. Absolutely. Um, so it's really good to hear that um, it sounds like the majority of people um, are familiar with these terms. Uh, but it's still good to have a refresher and it's still good for us to define our terms. And so we wanna talk briefly um, about how we define racial equity. Um, so we define racial equity as both a process and an outcome. Um, as a process, we apply racial equity when those most impacted by structural racial inequity are meaningfully involved in the creation and implementation of the institutional policies and practices that impact their lives, which is a little bit of a mouthful, uh, but it's important for us to say that as a process, um, racial equity means uh, people of color, uh, black and brown people, uh, that we should have uh, a place at the table when it comes to um, figuring out what it looks like uh, for people to be treated fairly. And as an outcome, we achieve racial equity when race no longer determines one's socioeconomic outcomes. When everyone has what they need to thrive, no matter where they live. So continuing to uh, talk through different uh, perspectives on what racial equity is and defining our terms for the simulation. Um, in the same way, when we think about racial equity, uh, we need to think about targeted approaches that account for historical trauma, first off. Second, the four forms of racism. And third, the barriers that disproportionately hurt people of color by race and ethnicity. As we see in this picture, uh, we have a really good visual illustration of the differences between equality and equity, right? In equality, we give everyone the same thing, regardless of whether or not it actually helps them or whether or not um, it's actually uh, going to put them on the same playing field. Whereas we see at the bottom, equity, uh, means not just giving everyone the same thing, but putting everyone in position to be able to do the same thing. So this picture um, is a very good illustration. Uh, and so when it comes to historical trauma, um, historical trauma refers to a complex and collective trauma experienced over time and across generations by a group of people who share an identity, an affiliation, or a circumstance. Uh, so slavery, forced relocation, genocide, or destruction of cultural practices are all experiences shared by communities that can result in cumulative emotional and psychological wounds that are carried across generations. Um, researchers and practitioners call this concept uh, historical trauma. And the effects of the traumas inflicted on groups of people because of the race, creed, and ethnicity linger on the souls of their descendants. The persistent cycle of trauma can destroy families and communities and threatens the vibrancy of entire cultures. As a result, many people in these same communities experience higher rates of mental and physical illness, substance abuse, and erosion in families and community structures. So we're going to share, that we're gonna show this five minute video. I need to stop my share because I forgot that I have to um, make it so that I can share the audio as well. 
Um, and uh, we're going to start the video. Are you seeing the screen now? Yes. Yes, you're sharing it. Okay, here we go. Not what happens to you, but what you remember and how you remember it. My dad said when they were growing up, they said, we used to play cowboys and Indians. And he started telling me this story. And we used to fight over. Um, Can you hear? We're, we're actually, or at least I'm seeing the um, PowerPoint presentation. I was hearing the audio, but the PowerPoint presentation is Hold on a second. The same on this. Right. Same on you. Okay. Sorry about that. Here we go. Uh, nobody wanted to be the Indian. Good. And he said, I didn't think about that. We'd all play, and I'd always suck it up, and I'd be... What matters in life is not what happens to you, but what you remember and how you remember it. My dad said when they were growing up, they said, we used to play cowboys and Indians. And he started telling me this story. And we used to fight over... Uh, nobody wanted to be the Indian. And he said, I didn't think about that. We'd all play, and I'd always suck it up, and I'd be the Indian. But how ironic is it for a bunch of Indian children to be playing cowboys and Indians and nobody wants to be the Indian. The introduction of a destruction of culture and loss of what is good. And I asked my dad, well, why didn't anybody want to be the Indian? And I thought I knew the answer. He said, because everybody knows the Indian dies. And that already in his generation, as strong as he was, he received a message as a young child. I received the same message that it was not good to be Indian. Slavery, colonization, forced relocation, and other historically traumatic events in generations past have lingering and profound consequences today. But what is historical trauma? Historical trauma has to do with collective, cumulative emotional wounding over and across generations that results from massive cataclysmic events. These are events that don't just target an individual, but they target a whole collective community. Things like forced relocation from traditional homelands like the Trail of Tears like my ancestors went through. But the process that our communities talk a lot about is that the trauma is held personally and it's and can be transmitted over generations. So even family members who have not had a direct experience of the trauma itself can feel the effects of that event generations later. Does historical trauma only affect certain groups of people? What really helps me to help people understand the notion of historical trauma is that it's actually a phenomenon that lots of communities, indigenous communities, or people all over the world have sort of kind of um, struggled with. It's not something that specifically is only owned by tribal people or indigenous people. It gets um, um, articulated all over the world. Historical trauma is widespread, affecting many communities across the globe. Observation has, uh, from the empirical side, started with um, work on the Holocaust survivors. And there's a lot of work on intergenerational transmission of trauma. And, um, and it's moved into also looking at Japanese internment survivors, Armenian survivors, descendants of the Holo their, their Holocaust, and so forth. So there's been some more, so, some more empirical work in this area. And you can imagine trying to track trauma over generations and trying to tease out what is the impact over generations on this child combined with whatever traumatic events they've gone through in their, their childhood and in their, in their lifetime. Historical trauma is passed on across generations. Well, I say to you, acknowledgement is due my grandfather, Pop. He never told us the stories of why he did certain things. He never shared with us why he never cried, for example. He never shared with us why he walked out the door when my grandmother cried why he turned his back when she cried. Of course we thought he turned his back because he didn't care, of course. But he turned his back as I look back now because the pain has no words. I still have the images, the images of him dealing with the limitations that he was up against. I can only imagine the pain. But what I do know is that it didn't go away it came inside into those of us who followed him. No one ever talks about the moment you found out that you were white or the moment you found out that you were black. That's a profound revelation. The minute you find that out, 
something happens. You have to renegotiate everything, and that's a profound psychological moment. I saw a water fountain that said white and colored. My family was seven kids by then. We drank a lot of Kool-Aid. So colored water, that was in my cognitive schema. So I go toward this colored water fountain. And while I'm there, just before I get there, there's a little white girl who saw that same colored water fountain and she was just about to turn the sprocket when her mother came and grabbed her by the arm. And she said, you cannot drink from that colored water fountain. And she said, but I want the colored water. I want the colored water. Oh, I want the colored water. So I knew it must be good. <laughs> so I run to the colored water fountain, looking for my mom, making sure she won't stop me from drinking. And I turned the water fountain. And it was clear, just like at home. That day, that trauma, I remember to this moment. For African American communities, historical identity and understanding is inextricably tied to the reality of enslavement. It ties us to enslavement with what an awful terror. 400 years of trauma we experience, and for us we talk about it as being utter cultural erasure. I am going to have to start the rescreen uh, so we can see the slideshow. So um, that is a that is a really rich and dense uh, video, and um, we would ask that you kind of take that with you as we go through the this, the this simulation um, and see how it can inform kind of your thoughts as we go along. So, um, so I'm going to talk about the four forms of racism. Now, we're we're kind of talking to you about um, how we're defining racial equity, and this is um, this is the perspective that we're coming from. This is not to say that this is the definitive uh, definition of racial equity, but this is what we're operating under. So, this is a race forward model, um, and there. In this model, there are four forms of racism, internalized racism, interpersonal racism, institutional racism, and structural racism. Um, those are important to remember because each of those plays a part. And especially when we're looking at policy, we can see what's at play here. So um, internalized racism is something that lies within individuals. So it's really about a person's belief, you know, my own private beliefs, biases about race and racism. Um, and it's influenced by our culture. It takes a lot of different forms. Um, and, um, you know, some of it is internalized oppression, which is the negative belief about oneself by people of color, or internalized privilege, which is kind of the opposite of that, which is beliefs of superiority and, or entitlement by white people. So interpersonal racism uh, is one that is that is between individuals. So that's the kind of bias that occurs when people with their with their internalized racism interact with each other. Um, and then uh, we have institutional racism, which occurs within institutions. Of course, in institutions, I mean institutions do not have emotions, people do. Institutions don't operate as people, people are within institutions, but institutions have practices, right? And, and that are discriminatory. Um, they have inequitable outcomes for people of color and advantages for white people. So it takes the power, it takes individual institutions, um, individual uh, to an institutionalized power. So structural racism is a, one that really is a cumulative and compounding, uh, it has an, a compounding effect and it's, it encompasses several of the societal factors, including history, culture, ideology, interactions of institutions and policies that systemically privilege white people and disadvantage people of color. Now, 
the third um, bullet point on the slide where we first started, where uh, we talked about historical trauma was um, about, um, you know, what, what is it that we, um, that we end up, that we're wanting to get, right? We want to achieve racial equity. That's what we're here for, right? What does it look like? If, if it doesn't look like this, what does it look like? So when we're looking for racial equity, it really will look like something like this, right? So people, including people of color, are owners, planners, and decision makers in the systems, all the systems that govern their lives. Now, you know, we acknowledge and account for past and, and current inequities and provide for all people, particularly those most impacted by racial inequities. This is the, the equity part, like the picture, getting people to what they need to, to uh, operate on that pl level playing field. So the reality is that when we do achieve racial equity, it's a system that benefits everyone, okay? Um, now, um, one thing before I go to the, to, the, to the small group is I want to um, let you know that this simulation that we're about to do, it really uh, hits that third bullet point, uh, which is the barriers. One of the things we, you know, we, we talked about, we had to consider historical trauma, we have to consider the four forms of racism, and then the barriers that disproportionately hurt people of color by race and ethnicity. And this simulation is really an example of that. We're going to talk about these barriers and how they have disproportionately hurt people of color by race and ethnicity and how they have disproportionately uh, benefited uh, white people. So let's go. We're going to go into a small group. Um, I'm not sure how many people we have 29 people. So we're going to make breakout rooms and kind of divide folks up in a smaller group. And I will put these questions in the chat. Uh, so you can see them. And these are just a couple of things. We're not going to take a whole lot of time, maybe like five minutes. You know, so given that we've just seen this, this kind of definition, we want to hear what your thoughts are and give an opportunity for you to talk about how this compares with your personal understanding of racism. And then if you have time, talk about some of the ways that you see this type of racism that we've defined playing out around you. So Jared is going to set up our um uh, our Karina can it, are you is it possible for you to put these in the chat these questions um yes I can do it okay and Jared will you take us uh into the into the the breakout rooms absolutely I'm ready when you are I'm ready when you are oh. we ready <laughs>
Jared, are we all are we all back in? It looks like it. Yep. Okay. So um, that was a lot longer than what I thought we were going to do, but I really appreciated that time. I hope you all had the really good conversations uh, that that we had in in our group. It was great. I'll have to remember that to maybe extend the time out. Uh, I do want to be mindful of time, so I may have to kind of speed it up a little bit. Um, are you still able to see my screen? No? No. Okay. This is a strange... I'm usually the one that um, that runs it, but we're kind of doing it on, on Rafi, so maybe it's just my control is off or something. So um, does anybody want to, uh, we don't really have time. We'll, we'll do that at the end. So let me, um, let me tell you a little bit about what some of the, um, oh, I think, yes. So these are the goals for the racial wealth gap simulation. And this is a collaborative effort. So this is what we talked about. We feel like these are Kind of the goals that we both want to see and uh first of all you know we want folks to really uh enhance their understanding of the racial wealth and income gap and hunt the hunger gap so we can do things um like uh understand why it's so important to address structural inequality uh, one of the ways that we do that is through um uh, policy advocacy uh, we also want folks to be able to discuss racial equity in our organizations, you know, where we work, where we live, our congregations, just in our communities, so that this uh, can be part of our uh, public speaking, uh, or, or so that it's not just hidden and not talked about, or only talked about in places like this, where we make an intentional effort that, that we can have a place, or that we can have this with us and, and take it into all the spaces that we occupy so that we can it kind of uh, incorporate it into our daily work, our, our life, our worship, our um, everything that we do, the advocacy that we do. Um, and of course, you know, the more you feel equipped, the more comfortable you feel talking to other folks. So these are some of the goals that we have identified. So now we're gonna start into the simulation. I need to tell you a couple of things. This is gonna be the instructions. You should have gotten um, a, an action worksheet, uh, an action card worksheet. Looks like this, you can print it out. Didn't have my name on it and it didn't have group A, but you can go, if you printed it out, you can write your name. And when I tell you what group you're in, which we're going to be doing that in a minute, um, you can use this. It looks really nice. And what, I, what I've shown here, you don't have to do it on your computer. You just take your pen or pencil and write when, when it's time to, to say, we'll say, you know, take an, a money card. This is the money card. There's a money card, a land card, and, a, and an opportunity loss card. You'll, you'll have to be making pluses and minuses because we can't actually do an actual tally because we'd have to take away some things. Uh, so the next step is if you, don't, if you don't have a printer and you couldn't print it out, you have a piece of paper and you can make this tally sheet. You don't have to use the fancy one. Do what I did. I put my name, my group, when we tell you what the group is. And um, Karina, while, you, while we're doing this, if you could assign a group, each of you are gonna be assigned a group. And there are 13 policies we're gonna go over, so I just listed them down. Just put money card land card and lost opportunity card and just tally them up as we go along. And I'll keep reminding folks as, as we go through each of these, it usually takes about five times and then people got it down pat and I don't have to say anything anymore about it. So if I get annoying, just say we got it. So we're gonna use this time and Karina is going to be um, putting either in front of your name or behind your name, either group A or group B. Right? Half of you are going to be group A and half of you are going to be group B. Now you're going to find out what that means once we read the first policy action. Um, you'll find out what the sign significance of that group assignation is. Uh, and once you see it by your name, uh, you can go ahead and write it. Um, here's a person coming. You can go ahead and write it 
uh, on, your on your tally sheet. So there's 13 policies in this that we're going to read. And after each of the policies, we're going to tell, we're going to give you some instructions about uh, what to do. And what you will be doing, it depends on what group you've been assigned. So there's three action cards, like I said, the money card, the land card, and the opportunity loss card. Everyone's going to gain or lose one, two, or sometimes all three of the cards in any given policy action round. So you're going to have to keep track of that. When we do it in person, we actually have little cards and you actually physically have them, which is great and wonderful. But this has been working pretty good. It just seems a little strange right now, but let's walk in faith and we'll get through it. So at the end, we're going to count how many of the money cards is the main thing because we're looking for the, um, the income gap and, and also the, the land because we're looking at the wealth gap. Uh, and opportunity loss. So you'll see at the end how it's how it's played out. So, so is everybody ready? Does everybody have their um, Karina? I'm, everybody... I'm assigning people. Oh, sorry. All right. So let me know when everybody is assigned, and let me just hear from folks. Is everybody okay with going forward at this point? Do you have um, something to write something down? Yes. 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 Wow, it's fantastic. Everybody, and I see everybody is getting their, um, just a matter of having to rename folks. Um, how are you doing, Karina? Okay, I'm just trying to make sure that they're... Um... Half and half? Yeah. Okay. So folks that who know, uh, it doesn't have to be that, you know, completely, just, you know, make sure you get... I see pretty much everybody has been assigned that for Michelle, Barreled and that's it, right? I haven't been assigned, Renee. Renee, okay. Where is your assignment noted? Uh, right, right at your name. Do you see your um, your name there? on the screen itself so no yeah oh yes i see it thank you so that's going to be uh who you are that's your assignation i see karina put hers at the at the back and i put mine has everybody got a this looks like everybody has except for uh how yeah. do we find uh our designation here look on the screen uh -huh. And you should be able to um, see your name, right? Uh, let's see. Let me try participants. There we go. Okay. I see my name under participants. And do you, and do you see uh, something, an A or a B, either in front or behind oh, your B, name? Oh, there it is. Okay. okay. All Looks right. like everybody's got their assignation. So we are going to be ready to go. So what we're going to have is we're going to have alternating readers, um, and um, and then I will read what the action is, and we'll go from there. Okay. So let's start with uh, either Jared or Michelle, and then we will alternate. Okay. I will go ahead and start. Uh, so policy number one is Andrew Johnson's land policies and sharecropping. After the Civil War, only 30,000 African Americans owned small plots of land compared to 4 million who did not because of, the, because of an 1865 federal law rescinded the government's promise of 40 acres of land for former slaves. These 4 million Blacks largely resorted to renting the farmland of their previous master in exchange for a share 
or crop. The system of sharecropping tied farmers to their former master because they were legally obligated to buy all farming materials, usually at higher prices, and sell their farming crops solely to their former master, usually at lower prices. So, um, can I just ask uh, folks who are not speaking, if you could just um, mute yourselves, that would be great. Or, uh, or Karina can, somebody can, can mute. Okay, so this is the first action, group A. So group A are black participants. So everyone who's group A, pick up one land card. That means put plus one on your tally sheet and uh, under your designation upper land card and one money card, so put plus one under the money card to represent the less than 1% of African-Americans who were able to own land and not face debt after slavery. Unfortunately, black participants should also pick up four lost opportunity cards. So that would be a plus four under your lost opportunity card uh, for the 4 million African-Americans who had the share crop and were denied the initial promise of land ownership. Buying farm supplies from the landowner at higher prices only to sell their crops back at lower prices resulted in African Americans facing higher levels of debt and higher rates of hunger. So this is only for group A, Black participants. You should have plus four opportunity lost card, plus one land card, I mean uh, money card, and plus one on the land card. Okay. Is everybody, is everybody okay with that? Any questions, let me know. Okay, Michelle, number two. All right, policy number two, land seizures. From 1865 on, blacks could have their land seized to pay sharecropping debts or simply because white landowners declared that black farmers or businesses were in debt. Black, blacks could not fight these charges because they were legally prohibited from suing whites in court. In addition, from 1949 to 1970, one million people lost their land to abuses of the power of eminent domain, which allows local governments to seize private property. About 70% of these families were African-American. So now we have the action for group A, black participants, return a land card. So now you need to put minus one under your land, under your, under your heading for land card. Um, um, for that land that was lost under land seizures. Also return a money card. So that's a minus one under your tag for money card. Uh, for the tens of millions of dollars lost from no longer having land to help earn an income and grow food to eat. Now group B, who are white participants. Group B will pick up one land card. So that's a plus one under your land card heading and two money cards, that's a plus two under your money card heading, for having the legal ability to seize the land of black farmers and business owners, increasing your income and reducing your vulnerability to hunger. Is everybody okay with the, what we need to do? So this is just uh, what it looks like. So group A, this is what you got. Group B, this is what you got for now. Okay, Jerry. Policy number three, the National Housing Act of 1934, part one. Policies under this law guaranteed federally backed loans to whites and legally refused loans to blacks and anyone else who chose to live in or near black neighborhoods. This practice known as redlining targeted entire black neighborhoods and identified them as grade D. This made it nearly impossible for appraisers in the private sector to do business in black neighborhoods because all the residents were considered bad credit risk. So group A, black participants, do not pick up any land cards because of the inability to purchase homes. Do not pick up any money cards since it was illegal to lend to Blacks, preventing them from building equity 
and weakening their ability to save for future needs. So basically, nothing happens with group A for now. Group B, white participants, pick up one land card, that's plus one under your land card, and one money card, another plus one under your money card, for the equity gained in purchasing homes not near black neighborhoods. Equity increased a family's ability to save for future needs. Basically, this is what it's looking like for now. Michelle? Policy number four, the National Housing Act of 1934, part two. Since this legislation prevented blacks from receiving federally backed home mortgages, whites usually purchased homes in black neighborhoods and then sold housing contracts to blacks who wanted to become home homeowners, often for two or three times the amount of the mortgage. These contracts only guaranteed black families the rights to the house after, excuse me, after all the payments were complete. Missing even one payment or being late could result in the black family losing their house immediately. So group A, black participants, pick up one land card, plus one under the land card for signing a contract for a home in hopes of becoming a homeowner one day. Do not pick up any money cards because contracts strip additional income and wealth from several generations. Remember, they had to pay more. Also, pick up one lost opportunity card, that's plus one for opportunity loss, because of the higher interest rate paid and less equity earned once the home was actually purchased. Group B, white participants, pick up two land cards at plus two for being able to legally purchase homes at the market rate and pick up two money cards at plus two for the equity earned from home ownership. So I think I'm done with saying the pluses and minus. I think you all got it. If anybody has a problem, just say, wait a minute. But for now, I think we've, we've, we've made it only to four and I think nobody needs any help, so let's go. This is what we should look like, what, what, what we have to up, up to now. Policy five, Jared. Policy five, the Social Security Act. This act excluded farm workers and domestic workers who were predominantly black from receiving old age and unemployment insurance. Although Social Security was meant to help those affected by the Great Depression and African-Americans were twice as likely as the average American family to face hunger during this time, 65% of African-Americans were ineligible to receive Social Security. So Group A, pick up one lost opportunity card for the inability to benefit from unemployment insurance, even though African-Americans were between two and three times as likely as whites to experience poverty and hunger. Okay, I can't help it. When it's pick up, it's plus one. Okay, so Group B, pick up one money card for being able to benefit from unemployment and old age insurance during a very grim time in American history. So we're seeing a lot of opportunity loss racking up on black participants and we're seeing some land and money racking up on white participants. Michelle? Policy number six, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. This was enacted to help bolster the economy and get the country out of the Great Depression, but it excluded tip-based jobs and other jobs predominantly held by Black workers, including servers, shoe shiners, domestic workers, and Pullman porters, from this first ever minimum wage legislation. Even though the Black unemployment, hunger, and poverty rates were at least twice those of whites during the Great Depression, the very policies meant to alleviate economic strain were withheld from the Black community. So group A, black participants, pick up one lost money, one lost opportunity card, sorry, for being stuck in tip-based occupations that didn't offer minimum wage to help families survive during the Great Depression. This made it even harder for them to get back on their feet and build for their future. Group B, white participants, pick up one money card for benefiting from the minimum wage to make their families less vulnerable to hunger and poverty. See the benefit of one is the detriment of the other. See, we're seeing these, the inequity begins or 
carries on. Jared? Policy number seven, the GI Bill of 1944. This was enacted to help World War II veterans adjust to civilian life by providing low cost home mortgages, low interest business loans, tuition assistance, and unemployment insurance. Unfortunately, black veterans were excluded from many of these benefits. So group A, black participants. Only one black participant. So that means in our group of all the group A's, somebody has to step up and say, I'm going to be that one. Uh, let's see, I can see who is. I'm going to pick the first one. Uh, Michelle, are you okay being the one group A participant that will put a plus one on their money card? You okay with that, Michelle? Oh, which Michelle probably. Uh, Michelle starts with a B. Michelle Belling Bellinger? Yeah, I'm okay. just following along. I'm not actually putting uh, anything on oh. my uh Okay, on my okay, card. then I'm, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pick Lori. Lori, are you okay? I got it. Okay, so Lori is going to be the one person in group A uh, who has a plus one. Everybody else who's group A do not pick up, uh, do not put a plus one. Uh, so that's representing the few African Americans who had access to some benefits of the GI Bill. All black participants pick up one lost opportunity card for not being able to, uh, can, you, can you mute folks, please? So all black participants pick up one lost opportunity card for not being able to benefit from the GI Bill, even though they too had fought for the United States in World War II. Group B, white participants, pick up two money cards, so that's plus two money cards and one land card for the opportunities you received such as government guaranteed housing loans, which helped to build the American middle class. So people are picking up, okay. Policy number eight, overturn a separate but equal doctrine. Although the, doc uh, although the separate but equal doctrine was declared unconstitutional in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, American schools are more racially segregated today than at any other time in the past four decades. Academic success is less likely in predominantly low income black neighborhoods. Black students are five times as likely to live in an area of concentrated poverty with underfunded, understaffed and overcrowded schools. This leaves black students with limited education and many often settle for minimum wage jobs that offer little hope of advancement or better pay. So group A, black participants, pick up only one money card to represent the 75% high school graduation rate among African-American students compared to 88% among white students. Also pick up one lost opportunity card for the lower student spending that helps funnel many black students into low wage work after high school. Group B, your action, white participants, pick up two money cards for having up to $733 higher annual per student spending on education than black students. This contributes to a greater likelihood of attending college and later get, getting a higher paying job. So opportunity or opportunities loss is racking up. Okay, number nine. Policy Turn. number nine, which is subprime loans. Starting in the 1970s and continuing today, the private sector issued subprime loans, loans with higher interest rates to black families almost exclusively, regardless of the family's income, education, or good credit history. As a result, blacks continue to unfairly pay more for homes of the same value as their white counterparts. This increases foreclosure rates among Blacks, which also contributes to higher food insecurity levels. 
So group A, black participants. Blacks were forced into subprime mortgages as their only option for more than three generations, stripping income and wealth from the black community. High income blacks were 80% more likely to lose their homes than high income whites when the housing bubble burst in 20, 2008. And 240,000 blacks lost their homes. Therefore, black participants pick up only one land card and one money card. Group B, white participants, pick up two land cards and two money cards for securing good interest rates on homes. Okay. Michelle? Policy number 10, the war on drugs. The war on drugs initiated in 1971 and continuing today, widened the racial wealth gap with policies targeting black and brown communities. Although rates of using and selling drugs are comparable across racial lines, Blacks are up to 10 times as likely to be stopped, searched, arrested, prosecuted, convicted, and or incarcerated for drug violations as whites. Since this means that Black families are up to 10 times as likely to have a family member sent to prison, they are more than 10 times as likely to fall into hunger because of incarceration. So group A, Black participants, Combined debt and property depreciation increase hunger and poverty rates within the black community. Return two money cards for being more likely to be incarcerated than whites and owing debts of about 13,000 per household and fees and court costs when a family member is incarcerated. Return one land card for the estimated 11 billion in lower property values in many African-American communities caused by the return of large numbers of people from jail or prison. Group B, white participants, return two money cards for the more than 180 billion in tax dollars that it costs to maintain mass incarceration today. Also pick up one lost opportunity card since these taxpayer dollars could instead have been used to support programs that end hunger and poverty in the United States. So here is the only policy where both group A and group B, oops, lost. Now there is something amiss here. So I'm going to read it from, uh, I'm missing, I'm sorry, I'm missing uh, policy 11. And it's not on mine either. So let me find it really quick. I apologize, but I can get it really quick. Oh, Rosa, I found it on my computer. I can just go ahead and, well, actually. Can you hear it? Uh, Oh wait, never mind. I think it's missing from mine as well. Weird. It it is unfortunately. I see that it is missing. So I'm going to have to um, stop the share. Oh, I'm so sorry. And I will open up. Um, one that has it, and I will read it for you. It looks like I'm going to be the only one that can see it. You know, and and um, these are the small things that happen. So policy number 11 is basically life after incarceration, consequences of the war on drugs. So when people are released from jail or prison, they're hoping for a second chance. But what they face is more than 48,000 separate restrictions known as collateral consequences. Some examples of lifelong penalties include being denied, denied the right to vote in some states, being prohibited from applying to higher paying jobs, being in an ineligible to, to participate in social safety net programs such as SNAP. SNAP is of course the, what used to be food stamps, it's the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and other restrictions such as being banned from getting a barber's license. So since blacks are up to 10 times as likely as whites to be stopped, arrested and sentenced, they're also 
up to 10 times as likely to face these restrictions. Now, when we talk about um, lifelong penalties, South Carolina still has a lifetime ban on SNAP for uh, uh, convicted uh, drug felons. Uh, so that is a lifetime ban. Uh, that and, and getting a drug felony in South Carolina is not hard, um, especially if you're a person of color. So for policy number 11, the action is for group A, participants only, there, there are five times as many Blacks as whites returning home from criminal records. Pick up two lost opportunity cards to represent how Black communities are more likely to fall into hunger because so many returnees are unable to reintegrate into society, get a job, and or access SNAP or other safety net benefits. Now, we are, you see the inequity is very visible in who has what cards. For policy number 12, Michelle. All right, policy 12, employment discrimination. Although racial discrimination in the workforce was legally abolished in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act, Racial discrimination continues among all educational levels and job sectors. For example, Blacks are twice as likely not to be called back after they complete job applications or interviews. In addition, the gap between the hourly pay of Blacks and Whites has grown from 3.55 an hour in 1979 to 6.73 an hour in 2016. Wow, so that's actually almost double the, the gap, the income gap. So group A, Black participants, pick up two lost opportunity cards for being two times less likely to receive a job callback and for earning an average of $14,000 a year less than your white peers. Doing the math shows that racial discrimination in the workforce costs Black workers at least $600,000 over the course of their working years. White participants, group B, pick up two money cards for being twice as likely to receive a callback for jobs, for a job, and for earning an average of 14,000 a year more than your black peers. See, it's the direct opposite. What is a benefit to one is a detriment to the other. Now we can see opportunity loss cards have really racked up and money and land have really racked up for white participants. This is the last policy. Policy number 13, voting restrictions. Voting is key to ending hunger. As early as 1890, Blacks faced organized campaigns to prevent them from voting, including biased literacy tests, poll taxes, and lynching. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act passed, making efforts to prevent voting illegal. But today, people returning from jail or prison who are disproportionately Black are denied the right to vote in many states. In addition, as recently as 2017, states have proposed voter ID laws, which would require voters to have government-issued identification. It is more difficult for African Americans to obtain these. One in four face barriers compared with one in 10 whites. Barriers include, for example, having to pay up to $150 for an acceptable copy of a birth certificate and social security card, travel costs, and time taken off from work. So the action for this policy, group A, Black participants, pick up one lost opportunity card for one, being prevented from voting in the early 1900s when their votes of black people might have prevented some of the harmful laws mentioned in the simulation from being enacted in the first place. And two, still facing voting restrictions that disproportionately impact black communities and weaken efforts to improve policies that end hunger and policy, hunger and poverty. Again, this is focused, this simulation is focused on the impacts of the wealth gap for hunger and poverty. So as we can see, pretty much if you look at this, the, the opportunity lost cards 
look almost the same as the number of money cards. So we have loss on one side and gain on another side. So you all will receive a copy of this uh, PowerPoint and I will correct that missing um, policy. But this is a timeline. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but this is what, you know, the, the cumulative. So you're able to look at it. And when you look at it as a whole, you can see the, you can appreciate better the cumulative impact of both the negative and the benefit, the benefit side. Um, so when you get your slideshow, you'll be able to look at it. So it's tally time. I know that some people were, were not tallying the cards, but if somebody who was tallying the cards, what did you get? How many, how, a group A, somebody from group A, how many money cards did you end up with? Well, I'm the one who got the extra card when no one else did, and I ended up with one. That means everyone else has zero. Right. That's correct. So here we have what the defined, if you came up with, if you have this. So we have the, the Black participants, only one participant, as you said, has a money card. One, everyone should have one land card. And there are 14, pardon me? Yep. That's right. And everyone should have 14 opportunity lost cards. Now I know sometimes things get mixed up and maybe it's not that, but that should be amounting to that. When we look at the white participants, money cards are pretty close to the opportunity lost card for black participants, it's 13. Land card is seven, as opposed to the one for the black participants. And here's the biggest difference. There is only one opportunity lost card held by white participants as opposed to the 14 for black participants. Now, why, this is why we're doing this. We want to see the impacts of these policies and in creating the racial wealth and in income divide. What you just saw, that, that ratio that we saw, that is actually uh, correct, right? A median net worth of a white household is 141,000, as opposed to 11,000 for a black household, and that's a 13 to one ratio. And we're talking about the one who got the card. So, but you're saying, well, there are, there are poor white people as well, and there are, but even in a uh, poverty level, Households living near the poverty line, white households have 18,000 18, in net worth. So that's, and black households, they don't have anything at zero. So it's an 18 to one ratio. I mean, 18 to zero ratio. So uh, these are stark uh, gaps that exist. Um, and that amounts to, uh, 40.6 million people in the U.S. who live below the poverty line. Um, and this is before COVID. We're working on updating all the numbers. Today, more than 41 million, this is before COVID, in the U.S. are facing hunger. Uh, the, there's current data, and on the slides, you'll have the access to that website where you can kind of delve through it. But even those, even those numbers are still, you know, coming in right now. Um, so, before the pandemic, right, half of U.S. households really were at risk of facing uh, poverty if somebody lost a job or got sick. Now we know they've lost their jobs, and a lot of people have gotten sick. So we can, I, you know, I am, safe, I'm feeling secure in saying that we're looking at a situation where 50% of the United States is facing poverty, and and that's incredible because when you look further at that. People of color are at least twice as likely to experience hunger, live below the poverty line, be one paycheck away from becoming poor. And that is that they are one of what they one or all three of those things they're vulnerable for. But people of color are more likely to face all three at one time. So the reason for this, the important part of this is we're looking at a wealth gap. So without wealth, we know you're more likely to be poor. 
right? You become poor, you don't, you cannot gain wealth. We saw the policies that frustrated the, uh, the black participants' opportunities to gain wealth. When you don't have wealth, right? When you're poor, you're more likely to experience hunger. So then we're stuck with hunger. So going up this chain is where we can see what is the root cause of some of these things. In this particular simulation, what we're looking at is we're looking at policies that fomented and created this wealth and in income gap. So now we're going to uh, break out. This is my favorite part. I know that there's a lot of things you might want to talk about. We're going to break out into, into um, I don't know how many groups you're going to put, Jared. Um, but when we come back, we'll have the opportunity to kind of ask questions and learn from each other. Um, these are just suggested questions. What I always tell people is speak the questions that came from your experience. These are just some questions that, that you know, some, some folks, you know, what did I learn? Sometimes people want to talk about what they learned, what kind of trends people saw, you know, how they see this in their own communities, right? How does it impact your community? Whether it's uh, group A or group B, there is impact, right? And, um, and what are your thoughts maybe about how can racial equity, uh, how can we achieve it given this kind of, historical perspective that we've just looked at, uh, but mainly really talk about your thoughts and your feelings about this experience in the simulation. So Jared, we're ready to go into a breakout. Rosa, did you want to do 10 minutes still or shorter? Um, well, I think we have time for, we have time for 10 minutes and we even have time for a little bit more, um, but I'd like to come back for all of us to be together. So I think 10 minutes, this is, this is a good time to kind of decompress everything and then come back with some, some um, questions that you really have that maybe you think I might be able to answer. And I say, maybe you think I might be able to answer, but <laughs> I might not have the answers, but we can talk about it as a larger group. And I can tell you what, what I think um, in, in, as it pertains to the policies. So yeah, we're ready. Oops, I was muted. Is everyone back? I think so. I think so. Is Jared back? Yep, I believe everyone's back. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have some time. There's just a couple of a couple of slides left, um, and I think that as a here in a in a large group, um, as we're all together, is there some things that folks want to lift up as something that really? I know I heard some incredible incredible um, statements, and like I said, um, there these questions are not you know the the only questions, but mainly is there anything that somebody wants to uh, contribute to this conversation in terms of their experience in the simulation?
Oops. I can't believe it. I heard such amazing things. Well, let me let me let me just uh, express to you that this is, can be a very emotional experience because as one of the people in, in my group talked about that they were unaware that there was actually the, pol the policy about exclusion of uh, domestics and farm workers and their family had worked in agriculture and, and, and thought about they, they had been excluded from the Social Security Act. And that was really, um, I think they said that, you know, kind of made them kind of choke up you know, um, because these are the these are those traumas that we're kind of unaware of. And when we see them, our hope is that not only do we start to uh, put these, you know, connect the dots, but we also start to see it within our own lives. Oh, so, you know, I had I had a, a person in one of the simulations. He has had two PhDs. He was living in a very comfortable um, kind of retirement community, and he was a, he was a black man, and he said, you know, he always felt that he had not quite made it, you know, uh, and then he said, but I didn't realize what weight I was carrying to even get here, so that to me was amazing, and then I had a white person say, well, a lot of this, she was remembering, she was about, I think she's about 93 now, so this is about three, about two years ago, maybe. She said, come to think of it, she, in her history, she could remember these things just happened. They suddenly got, they, they always had lots of land, things just happened, and then she started to see how those benefits, what we saw, uh, that, that kind of racking up of the of the money cards and the land cards and very little lost opportunity cards. Well, that was her history. So it made her at 90 years old, reevaluate her life. She's a very committed um, hunger activist. Um, and I love her to death because she goes to Washington and tells the legislators that she's, and at that point she was 80 something years old. She said, I don't have time to wait. <laughs> So you got to take your, you got to make this action happen fast. I have no time to wait. Um, so I, I want to think about um, some next steps. And I, I only have this, this one here. Um, and I'd like to leave kind of room for Rafi to talk about some things that might be coming up ahead. But one of the things I'd like to ask folks is to consider um, having the simulation is very user friendly. I'm just here just because we're collaborating on it, but this actually can be done. I don't have to be there. Uh, I'm happy to help anybody who wants to run the simulation in any of their networks, their churches, their community groups, um, whatever, just you can contact me and we'll, I have a contact card. Jared, do you wanna talk about any next steps coming up with um, Rafi in relation to this, this experience? Absolutely. Um, so after this event, we will be sending out some resources. Um, I think that Rosa will be linking to simulation online, as well as uh, some other uh, racial equity tools and some ways that you can learn a little bit more about the intersection of racial equity and hunger. Um, but you'll hear from us. Uh, we'll be sending out a survey uh, so you can offer us some feedback regarding how we could do this better the next time. Uh, we'll send out some resources and we'll also send you information on uh, our upcoming community conversations events. Um, if this is the kind of event that you found helpful uh, for you and your learning, development, um, and understanding different aspects of racial equity, uh, we definitely have a few events coming up um, that uh, will interest you. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Okay, um, well, I want to um, let you know that I'm really thankful for having this opportunity. I learn 
um, so much every time that I do this simulation as a facilitator, I've been a participant. I think as a facilitator, I'm still participating. Um, but, um, you know, everybody brings their own thoughts and their own um, experience uh, to this collective space. And I just uh, appreciate so much uh, being able to be uh, part of this space where we've all kind of experienced this. Um, and um, here's, can you all, can you all can, can see the screen, right? Yes, okay. So I have um, Jared and Michelle's uh, contact information, and then there's my contact information as well. Um, and on the slides, there's also the, the how, how you can access the simulation that is online, which is the in-person version, which I don't know when we're going to be able to be in person, but if you contact me, um, we, can, uh, we can work to kind of make one that fits your audience. Um, it is a, a tool that was meant to be, um, to be used in community, in congregations, in, in organizations. Um, we hope you say, you know, a little bit about Bread for the World helped to develop this, but it, does, it doesn't have to be a Bread for the World thing. It can be your thing. Um, and, and that's kind of the next step that I always leave people with is that um, how does this tool equip you to take your next step? And each of us are doing different things. Um, the, the, the next things that, that uh, Jared has shared with me about, about things that might be coming up is, you know, advocacy is such an important uh, thing for all of us to get involved in. And the more that we are able to understand policies, the better we're able to advocate for the impacts of those policies. And I'll take it a step further. I don't, I don't know many people on this, on this call, but I know that folks are doing things. You may be somebody in city council. You may be somebody on the food policy council. You may be somewhere situated where part of your job is writing policy. Now, all of us are impacted by those policies. If you are in a role where, you're, where you are actually involved in developing policy, isn't it a good idea to have a racial equity lens while you're doing that? Because we don't wanna be talking in 10 or 15 or 20 years or, or 50 years or even further, you know, how the, 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 what the impacts, what the racial equity impacts were negatively on the policy that you were a part of. And we're all part of it. We just need to engage. Uh, we, we, uh, it, we also talk with uh, policymakers to see where they're going. And we also can inform them. This simulation has been very useful in informing policymakers about the potential impacts of the policies that they're engaging in right now. So this is a history lesson, but it's also a gearing up lesson, and not a lesson, it's a gearing up session. So I hope that you all are inspired uh, to take whatever it is that you're doing to another level, and that in that next level that you go to, you take, uh, uh, as you continue to develop a racial equity uh, lens, you take that with you and apply it. And um, I think that's it. What's okay. that? Oh, I was going to uh, say if I could jump in real quick and say, um, you know, I want to applaud Bread for the World because they make all of these materials very accessible, right? So um, if you want to facilitate this in your own church or community or whatever, you can literally go to the websites that Rosa shared, um, get a... Um, get a PowerPoint already made, get the materials already made. Um, you know, we already shared all of our contact information if you wanna reach out to us to facilitate something. But really, I think the more people that have access to this information, the better. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw in that plug, yeah. Thank you, yes, definitely. It, you know, it, it, the, the first intention was to um, have it be very user-friendly um, but since we're also now kind of doing the uh, adaptations, um, we're happy to help folks with that. 
but um, and and I adapted this one. And when you go online to look at it, it will look very different than this because it's it's for we're working at we're still working on getting uh, a, a a universal one that will be um, for um, for use in a virtual sense. But I have it, and I can and and you'll have it too. So you can take what you get from me and you can adapt it if you're you know able to do it on on the on the powerpoint and you can make it your own but um i also am uh really uh uh love to do this um i think that um uh while we're able to i'm happy to do it um and i have a group that uh, i think jared was part of that where their congregation is pretty large and they have a, a discipleship leadership kind of group. And so I trained the facilitators so that they can be the ones to be doing it. That's what they asked for. They said, well, maybe how could we learn this? There is a, a policy packet which goes really in, into, into depth and, and your follow-up, I will send, I'll send that to Jared and Jared will send that out to everyone. So you can really look at the monster that this really is. But um, but it will if you were surprised by some of these things, some you know the, the the information in the policy packet, which it also has a facilitator's guide, will really uh, kind of blow you away. Um, uh, I I when I first saw it, I, I, I the policy packet is very in depth. Um, so if you're a policy geek, you will love it. Rosa, I wanted to ask a question real quick, if I could, and maybe this is something sure. maybe for for uh, Rafi. So I mean, not to get super political, but I mean, I think the the core values of the state were kind of shown a little bit in how folks voted, and as we look at you know just the the trends of what that looks like with our policymakers, are there any po things in North Carolina that you know of, or a policy, or something that's going on that we should be aware of that we can talk to uh, you know, folks in Raleigh or somebody, is there anything, is there a particular policy folks are working on as it pertains to hunger? Because I feel like hunger can, it, it tends to not be as politicized as other um, equity issues, so. Well, I can tell you that our, um, if it's okay, I'll, I will tell you that for Bread for the World, we have been really pushing, not just Bread for the World, but a lot of organizations uh, for a uh, COVID relief package. Um, and, it, and, and so I was really in, uh, encouraged to hear today that apparently in the first 100 days, there might be some push for that. But uh, we are making our advocacy efforts right, right now are kind of targeting um, Tom Tillis, Senator Tillis, um, because hungry families cannot wait, right? Uh, 100 days is 100 days too long. Uh, so we're kind of uh, we're, we're a faith-based organization, so, um, and I'm a bad Baptist, and I never know where anything is in the Bible, but I know Michelle's got me covered, and probably Jared, and probably several of you. I work with a lot of pastors, so it helps me, but, um, you know, the, the, the whole, of the, the whole uh, story about the walls of Jericho, right, where they crumbled the walls by, by circling, and, and, and uh, was it blowing the, the trumpets, right, and at some point, it fell, right, so there's this resistance that's happening. And to me, in my mind, I envision it, that's the wall, that, that's the wall of Jericho, right? And, uh, and we have to be um, faithful in our advocacy and we have to be clear um, that this is, a, um, this is a, an example of something that has to happen, right? Of a policy that has to happen. Uh, the timing is something that people are using, but this is something that has to happen. Uh, so that's what we're going to be uh, really kind of focusing on. Um, now, the farm bill, I know this is you know, Rafi's kind of, a lot of people don't understand the farm bill, look at the farm bill. You know, um, the nutrition program in, in the farm bill is the largest budget, right? Uh, and SNAP and all the nu nutrition programs, the hunger, are in that. So we in North Carolina are an agricultural state, right? Our, we're, we're the top, I think agriculture is still the, 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 the biggest uh, industry in North Carolina, right? So we need to be looking at those policies that impact not only our agricultural economy, 
right? But that also impact those who, who are the actors in that economy, right? And it's all the way down, right? And even consumers, we are part of that agricultural economy. Um, so I would say that um, if you want to impact hunger, that is a big policy to focus on. If you want to impact hunger, we are situated in a state where that can make a big difference. That can have a huge impact all around the country, all around the world, actually, right? Yeah. So I and hope I'll that just, answers your question. Yeah, and I can jump in for the for the Rafi side of things. Um, I think the the main way that we have been trying to get people engaged is around like action alerts. So we have um, you know an email list where we send out action alerts and. Right now, um, there, we have an action alert out around um, the Small Business Administration um, trying to make sure that they don't expand the loans that they are given out to give out to like big agribusiness, which I think is like under discussion, right? So those are the types of things where we send out and try to get people um, to call and email their senators and Congress people about these different issues. Um, and so when we email y'all, we can email um, a sign up to join our action alerts, but that's probably the biggest way that we try to get people engaged around policy and advocacy is just call call your Senator, call your Congressperson, tell them that you care about these particular issues that they're debating. And you know, one of the things that this pandemic has really taught us um, is uh, the, the truth that there is behind the global perspective that it's the small farmer who feeds the world, right? Um, so the, uh, the, the importance of the small farmer is, is, is sometimes like what uh, Merrill, you talked about, you know, hung, advocacy around hunger is kind of suppressed, right? Well, the importance of, of, of small and medium farmers is very much suppressed. But what this um, pandemic has really taught us is that the, um, the other aspects in, in, in the food system uh, are vulnerable. Uh, there are some vulnerabilities in our food system and it has to do more with distribution, um, processing. Uh, so uh, all of the things that the smaller farmers uh, don't have to struggle with as much, right? Uh, because they're not dependent on certain on those certain things and and so if they're that that makes them less vulnerable um so um that's uh, another thing that i think that um we have the opportunity to to get engaged in is uh uplifting what our where our strengths in like michelle is talking about call them up and and let them know i talk with folks uh legislators all the time and when i let them know that I know that agriculture is our number one uh, economic strength in this state. They know it. A and then we talk about things in a different way. Um, so agriculture and hunger are very much related, very much related. Uh, but within that, within that connection, there's many, um, uh, many things that we need to consider uh, in terms of how one can impact the other. Anybody else have something? Boy, I hope I haven't, uh, I tend to talk a lot and I try not to. I've probably, I've probably suppressed about 80% of what I would say. So it's a lot. So I know sometimes it's better to just hold the moment, hold the silence, because, you know, it doesn't mean that if you don't speak something now, you can never speak anything. I'm just inviting you to speak something. Well, I am impressed with your timeliness, because we are on time, right? I have 802 on one computer, and I have 757 on another computer, so I I don't even know. I'm 57. <laughs> okay. It was wonderful. Thank you, Rosa. It was a wonderful presentation and very enlightening. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Certainly appreciate it. Very good. Thanks Thank for you. being here, everybody. Thanks so much. So appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Really
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Jared, can you save the chat?